Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel. I hope you all are doing good. And in today's video, we will be covering and starting off with the second module, which is introduction to tissues. If you have missed the previous videos, which we have covered in this channel, where we are basically talking about introduction to anatomy and physiology, you can refer to those videos from the I button, which is given here. So before we dive into the video, I would like to thank each and every one of you who have subscribed to the channel, who have been liking my videos, commenting a lot of suggestions and opinions. And I'm really grateful to you all. And I would like to make sure that I'm delivering more content to you guys, which is going to be beneficial for you all, right? So without a further ado, let's dive into the video and let's start off with the second module, which is introduction to tissues. Okay, I hope the screen is visible right now. And uh, first of all, let's, let's discuss about amoeba, right? Now, what is an amoeba? As you all know, amoeba is all about a single blob which lives around us. It stays only in one place. They catch their prey, they digest the food, they excrete as well in the same place. Now, they don't need billions or trillions of cells to do this functioning all together and keep them alive. But if you compare it with human beings, right? Human beings are all about cell specialization. What is a cell specialization? Every cell in our body, it has its own specific job description, right? Now, unlike you apply for a, like you apply for a job, it has different, different job roles have different job descriptions. The same way, human body is composed of a lot of different cells and different cells are doing different kind of functioning and, you know, appropriate work to keep us alive. And it is maintaining homeostasis altogether. What is an homeostasis? revising it we covered it in the last video homeostasis is all about maintaining the internal balance of the body so that we can stay alive right now all the cells when they function together they balance materials and energy that keeps us alive basically we're talking about homeostasis here so how a human body is different from an amoeba amoeba is having only one uh, body one cell which is helping them to do all the function in one single place and it's keeping them alive but when you compare it with a human being, we have billions and trillions of cells inside our bodies which are doing different functions to keep us alive and to maintain the homeostasis, right? All those cells are most basic building blocks in the hierarchy. Now, as we compare, as we saw in the last video, a group of cells will be forming a tissue, a group of tissue will be forming an organ, and a group of organ will be orbing, uh, forming an organ system. And the organ system contributes to the human body, right? And that is what you can see here. But what is a tissue? A group of similar cells come together to perform a common function and that is probably known as tissues. So what are tissues? Tissues are like the fabric of our body. It's, and basically the term tissues literally means woven. When two or more tissues combine, they form an organ. Now, as, as, we, see, as we saw in the previous video, a group of cells will be forming a tissue and a group of tissue, either uh, two or three or more than one tissue come together to form an organ and these basically form your kidney your lungs your livers and different organs in our body now one thing that we need to understand here is the type of tissue defines its function or the organs function now let's say the type of tissue in kidney would be com completely different from the type of tissue you see in a heart right so these tissues function differently and they contribute to make an organ so different organs will function differently the same way different tissues are there which helps to or uh, helps to function this organs very differently based on their job roles or job descriptions now there are four primary types of tissues and what are those nervous tissue muscle tissues epithelial tissues and connective tissues now what is a nervous tissue if you know nervous tissue it basically helps us to control and coordinate and communicate with different body parts organs right so basically nervous tissue it helps in control communication and coordination what about muscle tissues now muscle tissues helps basically with the movement now as we all know there are a lot of uh, muscles which surround our bones right and these muscles and these tissues are helping us to move appropriately or make different kind of movements so muscle tissues basically helps us in movement what about epithelial tissues now epithelial tissues cover and protect the body now basically if you see your skin skin is also a group of tissue now the skin protects you from the external particles that are there in the surrounding so basically epithelial tissue covers and protects the body and what about connective tissue it provides support to the body 
right now as as the name suggests what what comes to your mind when you think about the word connective it is connecting two things and it is providing support to the body right so the same way nervous tissue muscle tissue epithelial tissue and connective tissue are the four primary type of tissues that you can see in the human body right now although physicians and artists have been exploring human anatomy for centuries right now as you all know in we just we saw in the previous video history of anatomy and physiology there are you know uh, scientists there are anatomists biologists artists who have been contributing to anatomy and physiology but still there are a lot of things which were un- unexplored right and that eventually brings us to the histology now what is a histology the word histology means the study of our tissues now it's not like when these physicians or these biologists one fine day they came out with the term histology or one fine day they started studying tissues because as you all know tissue is very small particle it, it it consists of a lot of cells coming together to form a tissue so it cannot be seen by naked eyes right now let's see how exactly the histology or the study of tissues came into existence what is a, what is histology again the study of our tissues the the study of the tissues in the human body or the living organism or the living creature is known as histology it is a greek word and histos means tissue and logica means science so the science of tissue or the study of tissue can be termed as histology so like we were discussing couple of minutes back right that we cannot see cells from our naked eyes and for that we needed microscopes in today's world if you want to see something which cannot be seen by your naked eye you need a microscope right now a microscope a microscope was something which was not existing in the late 15th 16th or 19th century right so let's see how the entire uh, uh entire concept of microscope and you know uh, seeing things from more zoomed in perspective came into existence so in the ni- in the 1590s right there were two individuals hans and zacharias janssen now hans and zacharias were you know uh, the pair of dutch spectacle makers so they used to make a lot of spectacles in the olden di- olden days right and what they did is basically they put some lenses in the tube and that basically changed the science forever and what happened was they basically took a tube they put some lenses obviously they were making a lot of spectacles at that point of time so when they put a lens inside a tube they start seeing more zoomed in uh, visuals of different different things now the only the only problem that existed with them is that even though they put a lens inside a tube it was causing a lot of problem and the only problem that they were seeing was magnification was very less and it was very blurry you they were not able to see the clear picture of what exactly they are observing under uh, the lens or under the so called microscope then what happened then in the late 16th century so in 1590s hans and zacharias came up with this model right wherein they put a lens inside a tube and they started seeing things from a more zoomed in perspective now what happened in the 16th century right in the 1600s what happened was there was a dutch man called or so called named as anton van Leeu- leeuwenhoek right he became the first to make use of truly high microscopes now what was the basic difference between the microscope the the microscope that hans and zacharias invented and the a uh, microscope that anton uh, made was basically the microscope used by hans and zacharias let's say it was only able to you know get you 50 times magnification right only 50 times magnification but what leeuwenhoek made it gave 270 times magnification right it is basically as small as the 1000th of a millimeter right and that became a breakthrough right now using his new microscope leeuwenhoek was the first to observe microorganisms bacteria spermatozoa muscle fibers and you know earning himself the title called father of microbiology and it was all because of the inventions that he did and the breakthroughs that we got through his invention so who is the father of microbiology anton van leeuwenhoek is the father of microbiology right but what happened was even he gave 270 times magnification he was again facing a problem the problem was most individual cells inside a tissue or in a tissue weren't visible in his average microscope so even though he was seeing 270 times magnification still they were unable to see the cells which 
maybe came up together to make a tissue right and that was the problem that he was struggling with now what happens is it took another year you know it took a lot of year to come up with another breakthrough when the invention of stains and dyes were came into existence so what are stains and dyes if if i can tell you in a basic example or if i can if i could tell you in simple words how do you observe a specimen first of all you would be uh, preserving it right first you preserve it or you fix it basically let's say uh, you have a heart and right you take us you you preserve heart first right and then what you do you slice it or you make it a section a dissection from that uh, organ or from that specimen that you have now why are you dissecting it or why are you slicing it to make sure that the light appropriate light is passing through the specimen right and then you stain it now what happens when you stain there are different different stains that you could use now when you are uh dipping the slice or the specimen that you have inside the stain the stain used to stick uh, to different different cells and through which you can see different different cells like nuclei like mitochondria cytoplasm under a microscope when when put under a microscope but again leeuwenhoek was the first person to came uh, to technically come up with a stain and he was basically using saffron to stain uh, to stain or dye his specimens that he was observing so to study biological structures under the scope in 1673 leeuwenhoek was using some kind of stain or dye which he basically built or developed himself using saffron and it 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 was it was uh, being used throughout the years and after that a point came when in the 1850s there was a german anatomist called joseph von gerlach now joseph von gerlach was the first person to come up with something called histological stain right and this was technically the first stain that came into existence which was used to see very very small you know cells fibers you know things inside of a cell like cytoplasm dna or pretty much things like that so joseph von gerlach developed the first histological stain in the 1850s what happened after that now back in his days right joseph he was using a compound called carmine what is carmine carmine is basically there were a lot of insects and a red dye was supposed to be derived from this insects from their scales once they are crushed up right so gerlach was using this compound called carmine now gerlach had some other luck using carmine to highlight different kinds of cell structure so like i mentioned he was through his dye that he developed from insects which is called carmine he was able to see different kinds of cell structure but again gerlach got stuck when he was exploring the tissues of the brain right so he was able to see pretty much everything but when he was trying to observe a specimen which was basically uh, a specimen from the brain he was not able to explore the tissues that exists in the brain and that was the problem that he was facing so when he was working in his laboratory uh, one fine day he tried making a diluted version of the stain which stain is it carmine he was using a stain which was carmine and it was obtained from you know the crushed up scales of the insect and he st- he tried diluting it he he was exploring he was brainstorming a lot of things and he was diluting different versions of this stain thinning out the carmine with ammonia and gelatin and trying you know a lot of permutations and combinations and he tried observing uh, the cell and he but still he was not able to observe the tissues that exist or the, that was present in the brain so he closed up the lab right and he was observing this one fine day he couldn't get through he was not uh, able to you know identify or observe the tissues that exist in the brain he gave up and one thing that happened was he forgot uh, to take out the specimen from the stain and the stain was there throughout now this stain that he was observing was from someone's cerebellum and he left it sitting in the solution for one fine day next day he returned to the lab slow soak and diluted carmine had stained all kinds of instru- uh, structures inside the tissue so what happened is by mistakenly he forgot the specimen inside the stain he came the next day to the lab and he took out that specimen put it under the microscope and he was able to see uh, you know a lot of things including the nuclei of an individual brain cell and that he termed or described as fibers that seemed to be linking the cells together 
so what are fibers fibers are the are the things which seemed to link the cells together so what are fibers fibers are things which helps you to link cells together now as i as i said right a group of cells will contribute to a tissue now a group of cell basically means a lot of things that are sticking together to make one complete blob and that linking was done through something called fibers and he was the first one to identify this thing now after another 30 years so now gerlach came and you know came up with his dye which was basically obtained from insects called carmine and it was somewhere around 1850s now after 30 years gerlach's famous neural stain was a breakthrough in the understanding of nervous system or the nervous tissues and it showed other anatomists how the combination of the right microscope and the right stain could open up understanding all about our human body the tissues and everything that makes life possible so neural stain was something that gerlach came after 30 years of his experiments research and observations and what he made through and what was the main uh, output or outcome that he was able to describe the combination of right microscope and the right stain could open up all our understanding about human body's tissues and how they make life possible right so sum- summarizing it again first of all anton von leeuwenhoek he was using a dye which was basically developed or made from saffron and he did a lot of observations using that and he was finding some limitations or some problems that he was not able to get through then after anton von leeuwenhoek there came joseph von gerlach now joseph von gerlach came with a different kind of stain which was dis- uh, uh, which was basically derived from the scales of the crushed up insects which was called carmine and after long time after after spending 30 years in the research and development of these different kind of stains using different microscopes he came up with a completely new and breakthrough which was basically called the neural stain right so so far we understood that nervous tissues was in existence now let's understand what is a nervous tissue and different forms in the nervous system so today we recognize the cells gerlach studied now as we know when gerlach was studying the cells of brain he came to know that there is something called fiber right now when he did a lot of uh, research a lot of analysis when he was trying to understand different different specimens he came into the uh, conclusion that there is something called nervous tissue why exactly it is called nervous tissue because it basically forms the nervous system that is the brain like you see the brain and the spinal cord the brain and the spinal cord which is running through the central axis of the body and the network of nerves there are a lot of nerves that runs around the body which is basically known as the central nervous system and apart from that basically he was also able to come to a conclusion there was something called a network of nerves in our peripheral nervous system which is highlighted in blue color right so the complete nervous system was in existence and which was basically consisting of central nervous system and peripheral nervous system right now that basic nervous tissue has two big functions now when you touch a hot pan right you sense that it is hot and your brain gives you a action or gives you a command to remove your hands or remove your fingers right now that is completely ha- happening because of two two, re- two reasons sensing the stimuli it is basically when you touch something the skin is able to understand what exactly what kind of object or surface or what kind of thing you are touching and it sends electrical impulses throughout the body often in response to those stimuli now if you can see this picture this is a nerve right it has a lot of uh, let's say uh, i will not go in depth but let's say for example it has a lot of endings nerve endings that i could say when you are touching something this nerve endings will touch and sense if something is hot it will send the electrical impulses directly to the brain to the nervous system and the brain will give you the command in response to the stimuli as to what you should be doing now one thing you need to understand is this nervous tissue or this specific tissue is also made up of two different cell types what are these two different cell types it was it is basically called neurons and glial cells so we will be understanding what neurons are and what glial cells are and how these two things contribute together uh to maybe make up a tissue now let's see what neurons are first right now neurons are the specialized building blocks of the nervous system so if you are not having neurons basically you will be someone who is paralyzed now when you touch something hot if you want to move your hands you will not be able to move it 
you are able to move it move it because neurons are there which are sending the electrical impulses throughout the body to the brain and because of which you are able to make some kind of action to some kind of response to that specific thing which you are touching now your brain alone contains billions of neurons right and they are what generate and conduct electrochemical nerve impulses so basically if you are thinking if you are dreaming if you are doing something it is all happening because of the billions of neurons that exists in your brain right now no matter where they are each neuron has the same anatomy consisting of cell body dendrites and axon so if you can see this image in our body all the neurons have the same structure and the neurons consist of cell body dendrites and axon right so there are three important components to a neuron it is basically cell body dendrites and axon now let's see what a cell body would do what a dendrites would do and what axons would do right now the cell body or soma now the cell body or this specific green green colored thing it is also called soma or cell body is the neuron's life support now as you know we all need oxygen to survive in the same way the uh, neurons basically need the cell body to survive now so the, the neurons life support system is basically the cell body it's got all the necessary goods like nucleus mitochondria dna everything that the specific uh, neuron requires to survive and sustain that is consisting inside a cell body and cell body hence acts as a life support to the neuron all right now again as i said the neuron will consist of nucleus mitochondria dna and all pretty much important things that a cell should consist of so that's all about cell body now what are dendrites now the bushy dendrites now as you can see in this uh, figure right it is highlighted in gray color they are having a lot of branches and it it's very bushy like a tree so these bushy dendrites look like trees and that is where they are named after so what they do basically is they collect signals from other cells and sends it back to the soma so they are the listening end so as humans we have ears to listen to maybe acknowledge and maybe to come or give an answer in the same way the cell or the neuron has dendrites they are acting as you know uh, the collection point where they collect signals from other cells and they send it to the cell body and that is why we are able to take up decisions because then the cell body will send electrical impulses through the axon to the uh, to the another neuron and like that it's like a connected thing which goes to your brain and the brain is able to take up a decision and because of which you will be doing the necessary action so what are cell body cell body is the life support to a neuron what are dendrites dendrites are basically used to collect signals from the other cells and sends it to the cell body then what are the third what is the third component axon cell body dendrite and axon what is an axon now the long rope like structure so as you can see the in purple color the axon is really long and it looks like a rope so what it basically does is it carries message to other neurons thus uh, and other muscles and glands and together all of these combine to form nerves of different sizes laced throughout your body right now again what an axon is doing is basically that axon carries the message or transmits the message to the other neuron right so if i can come back in the first picture and let's see if i could explain you now if you see this just imagine right this same structure is in the right side of the screen now the right side of the screen the dendrites will collect the signal it will send to the cell body cell body it will come to the axon from axon it will come it will come to the other tip which is the other dendrite of the another neuron again the same thing would happen and they like that it is a connected structure which sends the impulses till your brain right so i believe now you understood how or what a neuron is now there is second component to basically a nervous tissue it is called glial cells what are glial cells let's see that now so coming down the other type of nervous cell which is the glial cell are like neurons pit crew what is a pit crew if if you have seen formula 1 or if you have seen any racing events after you know taking a lot of laps the car will come to the pit stop where the entire team will change uh, the tires they will do all the necessary servicing that is required and then the car moves back into the track the same way what glial cells do is they provide support insulation and protection right and tethering them from blood vessels so all these neurons right all these neurons or the nervous tissues are basically protected by glial cells they are providing support insulation and protection 
right but sensing the world around you isn't much use if you can't do anything about it which is why we have got muscles muscles tissues right so there is nervous tissue and there is also muscle tissue now again imagine right if you are walking if you are running if you are doing different kinds of movement it is not happening because only of the nervous tissue because there is also a second component called muscle tissues because of muscle tissues you are able to move run and do pretty much things that you do in your day to day activities now what are glial cells if you can see in this image this is a, nerve, a neuron it is consisting of dendrites cell body axon now around these there will be glial cells which will protect these nervous uh, neurons basically which will protect these neurons from damage or insulation or it will provide any kind of support that they would need right so i believe if you look at this image you can get a better understanding as to what glial cells are okay now as i said there is a second a second type of tissue as well which is called the muscle tissues which basically helps you to make different kind of movements well, let's let's study about that as well now your muscle tissue can contract and move which is super handy if you want to walk or chew or breathe or run or do pretty much any activity that you want to do now mus muscle tissue is well vascularized meaning it's <laughs> it's got a lot of blood coming in and going and it comes in three different flavors basically there are skeletal muscle tissue there are cardiac muscle tissue and there are smooth muscle tissues so if you remember there are basically four types of primary tissue now what are those primary tissue nervous tissue connective tissue and uh, epithelial tissue and muscle tissue right so nervous tissue is made up of uh, neurons and glial cells and then there is muscle tissue now the muscle tissue is again having three different kinds right and what are these three different kinds like we said there are skeletal muscle tissues there are cardiac mus uh, muscle tissues and there are the, and then there are smooth muscle tissues now let's see the characteristics of these three different kinds of muscle tissues right first skeletal muscle tissue now the, your skeletal muscle tissue is what attaches to all the bones in your skeleton supporting you and keeping your posture in line if you could see the small image that is there right there is a skull and there is pink highlights that you can see in the skull if you cannot see it properly maybe you can zoom in and you can see so skeletal muscle as the name suggests it sticks all over your skeleton and this tissue basically pull on bones or skin as they contract to make your body move now if i am moving my hand like this my bone is consisting a lot of skeletal muscle tissue which is helping me to make these kind of movements right now you can see how skeletal muscle tissue has long and cylindrical cells now i won't be referring to these uh, text that i have put rather than i let's let's see exactly how the skeletal muscle looks like so if you could see this image there are parallel they are parallel to each other right so all the things now if if i could explain in a more better way the striations right the striations that you see they are parallel to each other they are not irregular they are very parallel to each other other than that what is the second characteristic they are multinucleated they would have maybe two nucleus right so skeletal muscle tissue they have they are multinucleated and they have parallel cells so the striations are parallel and the fine black running perpendicular to the fibers so basically if i could explain in a more better way if you can refer to these linings in between these are the fibers which are acting as the connective link between the two cells so the group of skeletal uh, muscle would be consisting of a lot of cells now they are striated they are multinucleated and also uh, they would be perpendicular to the fibers right so that is all about skeletal muscle tissue now moving to the other type of muscle tissue which is the cardiac muscle tissue so as the name suggests cardiac you can refer to heart right so basically these kind of muscle tissue you would be only seeing in the heart it will not be present anywhere else in your body you can only see these in your hearts because it forms the walls of the heart and it would be, and it would be really distracting to have to remind it to contract every second so basically the brain should not uh send impulses to the to, to these cardiac muscles to keep uh contracting or relaxing at every seconds right it should do its work involuntarily right it it should automatically do its things and that is why this muscle you would be telling that they work involuntarily right 
Now this tissue is only found in your heart as I said its regular contractions is what basically propels blood throughout your circulation circulatory system. So basically heart pumps blood the walls of the heart are made up uh, heart are made up of cardiac muscle tissues. Now let's see the characteristics of cardiac muscle tissues right. Now if you can see at this structure the cells and the cells divide and converge one nucleus per cell so these are only having one nucleus so you could say the cardiac muscle tissues are uninucleated they are not multinucleated they only will have one nucleus per cell and that is why it is called uninucleated right striated with intercalated discs so there are a lot of striations that you see throughout uh, the base throughout the fibers or the cardiac muscle tissues right and as I said, they are uninucleated. And the last thing that I would like to mention is these are not parallel. They are very messed up and they are basically having something like a cross-linking kind of structure if you can see. So they are not parallel. They are messy. And let's say this is one uh, muscle tissue. Now these one muscle tissue will be connected with each other. Now the connections, right? If you can see these blue highlighted things here. This basically are called intercalated discs which connects two cardiac muscle tissues with each other right so what are the characteristics of cardiac muscle tissue they are uninucleated which means they have only one nucleus per cell they do their work involuntarily automatically they would be doing their work and the third thing would be they are having a messy and like a cross-linking kind of structure and the last one would be they have intercalated discs which helps them to connect with each other right so that is about cardiac muscle tissue now let's see the last one which is basically smooth muscle now smooth muscle tissue which lines the wall of most of your blood vessels and hollow organs like let's say your digestive system or you know the the, 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 the digestive system the urinary tract and the uterus as well in, in that case now all these hollow organs right which which stores up something inside them is something where you can find smooth muscles now why is it called smooth muscle because as you can see these specific structures right if you can see this specific image they are short tapered they are very short in structure and they are tapered in both the ends now this end is the upper end is tapered the lower end is tapered right and there are no striations if you see the cardiac muscle will have these kind of striations and the basically the skeletal muscle tissue also has a lot of striations but if you see the smooth muscle they don't have any kind of striations in that right its cells are sort of short and tapered like i said at the ends so the upper, both the ends would be tapered and uh, they are arranged in this form to form a tight knit sheet now if you can see your clothes or if you can see some nets they are all interlinked with each other right and basically they are looking like knits right now this tissue is also involuntary because like the heart these organs squeeze substances through the body now your stomach right it's not that let's say if you are drinking some kind of juice the juice will stay inside your stomach after some point the muscle uh, the stomach has to push that liquid to the next stage right so all the organs where smooth muscles are present they should also do their work involuntarily they should do it automatically right so and how they do it by contracting and relaxing different organisms uh, different organs right so that are, that are the characteristics of smooth muscles summarizing the characteristic smooth muscles are short and tapered both the ends would be tapered and uh, they don't have any striations and uh, apart from that yeah so you can only remember these two characteristics about smooth muscle so what did we cover today we will stop here we won't be covering a lot of things in the same video so summarizing it again firstly we saw the four primary type of tissues which is connective tissue muscle tissue nervous tissue and epithelial tissue then we saw specifically what are the main components of a nervous tissue where we studied about neurons and glial cells. Then we studied in detail about neurons wherein we got to know about the cell body, the axon, the dendrites and we studied about glial cells which basically provides support and protection and insulation. Then we covered muscle tissues right in muscle tissues also we saw three different kinds of muscle tissue. The skeletal muscle tissue, the cardiac muscle tissue and the smooth muscle tissue. What are the characteristics? 
uh, summarizing it again skeletal muscle tissue is multinucleated and it would have striations which are uniform and parallel to each other at the same time it is perpendicular to the fibers these are the three characteristics of uh, the skeletal muscle tissue what are the characteristics of cardiac muscle tissue the cardiac muscle tissue is uninucleated and uh, they don't have uniform stri uh, they don't have uniform uh, striations they would be something you know messy and cross linking with each other at the same time the end of each of the cardiac muscle tissue would have intercalated discs which will help them to connect with each other and apart from that the last thing would be uh, they also have striations but they are not parallel and uniform to each other right the last one is smooth muscle there are only two characteristics smooth muscle should also do their work involuntarily they have short and tapered ends which means the upper end and the lower end of the specific tissue would be tapered and there will be no striations right so that's all about smooth muscle tissues so there are some questions if you can see which kind of muscle uh, tissue is this they are striated they have one nucleus now which tissue or which muscle tissue had one nucleus the cardiac muscle tissue right and as you can see uh, they are messy and they are having like a cross linking structure but they are not uniform at the same time they are having these intercalated discs between them which makes pretty evident that it's a cardiac muscle tissue which is the second one that you see on the screen these are also uninucleated they also have one nucleus uh, per cell they are packed together very compact packing there are no striations and they are smooth smooth refers to smooth muscles and no striations right there are three muscle fibers if the muscle fib uh, muscle tissues if the muscle tissue is not having any striations it is a smooth muscle tissue okay and the last one is obviously uh, the uh, the last one which is the skeletal muscle tissue as you can see they are multinucleated the striations are uniform and parallel and also perpendicular to the muscle fiber right so we would be stopping here so summarizing all the things again from the top what all did we see today uh, starting from the beginning we saw the uh, we, saw, we we studied about amoeba then we saw about cell specialization then we saw homeostasis then we basically saw what are tissues what are the four primary type of tissues then we understood what nervous tissue is muscle tissue is epithelial tissue is and connective tissue is then going in deep we understood the history of histology where we came and we understood how the study of uh, tissues came into existence we studied about hans and zacharias who were spectacle makers then we study about anton von leeuwenhoek who used saffron dye to study his specimens and then we also studied about joseph von gerlach who used carmine which is a uh, dye or which is a compound which is which is uh, derived from the scales of crushed up insects and then we saw how we study a specimen and uh, after that we study about nervous tissue we studied about neurons and glial cells which basically make up these and in neurons we study about the cell body the axon and the dendrites we studied that glial cells help in insulation absorb insulation providing support to to the things and then we studied about muscle uh, okay. tissues where we saw three different kind of muscle tissues skeletal muscle tissue cardiac muscle tissue and smooth muscle tissue and we also studied the characteristics as well so we would be ending this video here so that's about it for today and in the coming videos we will be studying about the remaining two kind of tissues uh, in the primary types that we didn't cover at this video so in the next video we will be covering those tissue types as well and we will be understanding what are the important things that we should be studying about them and if you like this video please press the like button do comment your opinions suggestions and any video recommendations if you have subscribe to the channel please press the bell icon so that you get you get notified when i am uploading the next video and see you in my next video till then stay safe stay home and let's learn and grow together